Good afternoon. I'm Sally Russell, the Director of Education Services for the American Nephrology Nurses Association. We are so glad that you could join us today for this timely webinar. Participants in today's webinar will need to complete the Nursing Continuing Professional Development process by evaluating the webinar at the end of the session and retrieving their certificate of attendance. This process is completed online. The webinar will also be available post live session in the ANNA online library. Before we get started, I would like to take a, a moment to review a few of our technical features. We would like today's webinar to be interactive and we encourage you to submit questions to our presenter using the questions tab on the left hand side of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Our speaker will do her best to address your questions verbally at the end of the program. If you would like to take notes, you can click on the notes tab on the right hand side of the screen to utilize the text box. Your notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. If you're interested in a copy of the PowerPoint, you can click on the resources tab on the left hand side of the player. Simply click on the file name to initiate the download. Also, if you experience any technical programs during the course of the webinar, you can click the request support button in the lower left hand of the player to receive assistance from our technical experts. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Tara Nelson is an infection prevention consultant in Atlanta, Georgia. She has over 15 years of clinical nursing experience, including five years as an infection preventive preventionist and two years as the hemodialysis nurse. Dr. Milton is active with the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology or APIC and is a member of the practice guideline committee where she has advocated for improved attention to infection prevention in the hemodialysis patient. She is certified in infection control and is a published author in the field. And now I will turn the webinar over to Dr. Tara Milson. Thank you, Sally, and welcome everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking with you about a hot topic, which is of course, COVID-19. Many people in the United States have been able to reduce their risk of exposure to this disease through teleworking or social distancing, but we in healthcare have to come to work because we have to take care of patients. And likewise, um, hemodialysis patients, most of the time still have to come to the healthcare environment several times a week in order to receive their treatments. Today, I'll be talking to you about some strategies to reduce the risk of acquiring and spreading COVID-19 in the dialysis setting. Objectives for this session are to understand the interim infection prevention and control guidance, which has been developed by the CDC, to mitigate the risk of infection for healthcare workers by the correct selection and use of personal protective equipment, or PPE, and to protect patients from the risk of infection by screening and isolating symptomatic patients. <clears throat> Healthcare workers are on the front lines of caring for patients with confirmed or possible infection with coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19, and therefore have an increased risk of exposure to this virus. Healthcare workers can minimize the risk of exposure when caring for confirmed or possible COVID-19 patients by following standard and transmission-based precautions and the infection prevention and control recommendations as published by the CDC. We have had outbreaks of novel and emerging viruses in the past. For instance, you may remember SARS from 2010 or Ebola from 2014. These outbreaks were limited in scope, and we were able to cohort the few infected patients to healthcare facilities that were specially equipped to handle them. The challenge of COVID-19 is very different. As the disease spreads in a community, many patients on dialysis in the same geographic area are likely to become infected and require continued dialysis treatments. Thrice weekly dialysis poses the risk of infection spread among patients and staff. Early in this pandemic, patients on dialysis who are symptomatic may have been referred to a hospital for diagnosis and management. However, as the epidemic spreads, hospitals can become overwhelmed. Um, patients on dialysis without serious complications may have to stay home and still receive their dialysis in outpatient facilities. In addition, you may start to see patients with new onset of renal failure, which may also need dialysis in the acute or outpatient setting. 
outpatient dialysis facilities must anticipate and prepare for dialyzing patients infected with COVID-19 at their facility or in clustered regional dialysis centers. To prepare for the eventuality of dialysis patients being present in all health of COVID dialysis patients being present in all healthcare settings, and to help provide evidence-based guidance to clinicians, there are some great resources available on the CDC website to help help you prepare um, and to keep up to date as the COVID-19 pandemic continues. I'm going to cover some of the highlights of the recommendations, which seem to generate a fair number of questions that we are seeing on the ANNA listserv. Remember that this situation is continuously evolving and the guidance is updated frequently. I recommend that you get in the habit of routinely checking the CDC website for updates and I've included a link to that um, website on this slide. So briefly, just to cover what COVID-19 is, it's a disease caused by a new strain of coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2, which was first identified in the Wuhan province of China in December 2019. Since that time, this virus has spread throughout the world, and a global pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization in March 2020. There is a broad range of symptoms, which can range from asymptomatic carriage all the way up through um, death. Like most respiratory illnesses, the risk seems to be the greatest for patients who are elderly and for those who have comorbidities. Because of the varied presentation of the disease and the high rates of asymptomatic carriage, you must be prepared to care for COVID-19 patients in your, um, your PD program, your home dialysis program, outpatient clinics, inpatient clinics, and at the bedside of critically ill patients. The symptoms of this disease can range from very mild to very severe. Most known cases, about 80%, will recover without any special medical care, but about 20% of patients may develop a severe disease which will require hospitalization, and about 5% will require intensive care. The risk for severe disease is thought to be higher for patients, again, um, who are elderly and have comorbidities, and children do not seem to be affected quite as harshly as those who are older, although there have been several pediatric deaths that have been reported recently. On average, about five days will pass between exposure and symptom onset, but the range is very broad and we're still learning. We find that symptoms are first are present for about a week in milder cases and can last for several weeks up to a month in more severe cases. The attack rate of new infection for close contacts is about 10%. And um, hopefully as we increase testing capabilities, including antibody testing, we'll have a better idea of the role of asymptomatic carriage and, what it, how, and the role it plays in this transmission of this disease. I have here a chart from a recent article that was published in Microbes and Infection, which shows the fatality rate and the infectivity of some recent viral outbreaks. As you can see, right up on top is the um, now what's called COVID-19, which has a reported case fatality rate of about 3%. But over on the right, um, where the R with a subscript of zero, that's called an R naught, and that means how many on average, how many patients are infected by each infected person. So for, for uh, COVID-19, they'll infect on average between 1.4 to 5.5 other patients. And it seems to be about 2.8. And that's based on the data that we got from the Princess Diamond Cruise Line. Um, also, you might notice that the case fatality rate is about the same as the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic that killed millions of people through across the globe. So 3% may sound small, but that translates into thousands or hundreds of thousands and potentially millions of lives. This data is from an MMWR that was published at the end of March. The CDC looked at about 75,000 patients with COVID-19 in the United States who had at least one comorbidity and the data was from February 12th through March 28th. For each of these comorbidities, they looked at the number of patients with, with that comorbidity that were either not hospitalized, hospitalized, or admitted to ICU. And what they found was that the prevalence of chronic kidney disease was only about 3% of the total study population. 
However, these patients were far more likely to end up in the ICU and to die with COVID-19 infection than patients with any other comorbidity. For those with chronic renal disease, almost 28% would end up in ICU with a severe illness or death, whereas the next highest group was cardiovascular disease, where 21% of those patients would end up in ICU. So as I mentioned before, COVID-19, it's a new disease and we're still learning a lot about how it spreads, but it is believed to spread person to person primarily through large infectious respiratory droplets that are shed when a person coughs, sneezes, or talks. These particles can then land in the eyes, nose, or mouth of persons who are nearby, or they can be inhaled by those within close proximity. We call this droplet transmission and the infection spreads when the particle contacts the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, mouth, or respiratory tract. These droplet particles are heavy, and they don't stay suspended in the air for very long. They typically fall to the earth between three to six feet once they're expelled. Wearing a face mask and eye protection, plus a gown and gloves, can help protect you from these large respiratory droplets by creating a physical bar barrier over your mucous membranes. Another route of transmission is direct contact. This is where the disease is transmitted directly through close contact with the infectious particle. Another route is indirect contact, and this can occur if the effect infected person touches a surface and deposits infection infectious material, which you later touch and then say rub your eye or um, eat something. We have been able to recover the virus that causes COVID-19 from surfaces for hours or even days after it being being transferred to a surface. The virus can live for about a day on cloth and paper and for several days on plastic and metal. It is possible to get COVID-19 from touching these surfaces and then touching your eyes, your nose, or your mouth. This is why hand hygiene, glove use, isolation gowns, and surface disinfection are so critical in preventing COVID-19. It is believed to be unlikely for transmission to occur person to person over long distances. However, small particles may stay suspended in the air for longer periods of time, and because of their small size, an N95 respirator is recommended during performance of aerosol-generating procedures or if spending an extended period of time in the room of a patient with COVID-19, such as one-to-one -one dialysis where the practitioner remains at the bedside. Unrecognized asymptomatic and presymptomatic infections likely contribute to transmission in dialysis and other healthcare settings. Source control, which involves having the infected person wear a cloth face covering or a face mask over their mouth and nose to contain their respiratory secretions, might help to reduce the risk of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 from both symptomatic and asymptomatic people. The role of the mask is to prevent the wearer from expelling respiratory droplets when they talk, cough, or sneeze, especially cloth masks. These droplets are contained within the fibers of the mask so that others can't breathe them in. There is not as much protection for the wearer when they're breathing in, and that is why it's crucial that all parties wear a mask. That's to help prevent the droplets from anybody being expelled into the air. If both parties are wearing masks and one of the parties is infected, the risk of transmission is very low. Surgical masks used by healthcare workers have the added benefit of protecting the wearer from splashes and sprays, which may contain infectious particles. It is still important to maintain a spatial separation of at least six feet, even if masked, to reduce the chance of transmission even further and to help eliminate the role of contaminated surfaces in transmission. Patients should be instructed on the proper use of face masks. If a patient arrives without a mask and one is not available, tissue should be provided and the patient's instructed to cover their nose and their mouth when coughing, talking, or sneezing, and to discard the tissues appropriately. In addition to source control, it is important to implement a screening procedure. Patients with COVID-19 may be asymptomatic or symptoms may appear two to 14 days after exposure. Patients with symptoms, those who have traveled to endemic areas or those who have had contact with persons infected with COVID-19 should be asked to call ahead to the dialysis facility to anticipate their arrival. Screening personnel at a single entry to the facility should ask all these same questions upon arrival. If patients answer yes to any of the questions, 
they should be required to wear a face mask and directed to a room away from the general waiting room. Medically stable patients can wait for evaluation in their private vehicle or outside the dialysis facility. Because testing kits for confirming COVID-19 have been slow to disperse um, and test results can also take several days. Patients with fever, new cough, or dyspnea should be treated as though they had COVID-19. For patient placement in an acute or acute, excuse me, in an outpatient or an acute dialysis setting, best efforts must be made to isolate patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Separate rooms with a door closed may be used if available, except those used for treatments of patients with hepatitis B. If no separate room is available, patients suspected to have COVID-19 should be cohorted on a designated isolation shift if possible, or dialyzed in a designated COVID-19 facility. If patients with COVID-19 must be treated at the same time as patients who are asymptomatic, the patients who are symptomatic should be treated in a corner or an end of the row station, and at least six feet of separation should be maintained between that masked symptomatic patient and any other patient and also any other dialysis station. The CDC guidance does not currently recommend that patients infected with COVID-19 be treated in an airborne infection isolation room. For in-room dialysis, whether in acute care or in outpatient, a goal is to reduce the exposure time as much as possible. The CDC does recommend that for dialysis staff providing one-to-one -one dialysis to a suspected or confirmed COVID patient, that exposure time be limited by having the staff observe the patient from outside the room through a window or by using a camera rather than having them stay at the bedside. Although we don't yet have concrete data that indicates that there is a greater chance of transmission with more time that is spent in the room, there is a theoretical risk. And therefore, it makes sense just to try to spend as much time outside the room as possible. However, you can't forego patient care, so you still have to perform all essential tasks and closely monitor the patient. If staff must be in the room, they should wear an N95 mask instead of a surgical mask and eye protection, plus a gown and gloves anytime they're in the room. And also the patient should wear a mask. Staff should be very meticulous about hand hygiene, change the gloves frequently, and disinfect anything that they touch or that comes out of the patient room. And facilities might want to con consider adopting some sort of contingency plan to mitigate the possible risk of increased exposure time to a COVID-19 patient one of the strategies we're using in my facility is cohorting dialysis patients to one section of an acute care floor, and then one dialysis nurse will take care of two or three patients and observe them through their glass doors. The same principles apply for home dialysis. You wanna reduce exposure time as much as possible. Consider using alternate technologies such as telehealth or even FaceTime to have virtual appointments rather than having patients come to the healthcare facility for routine clinic appointments. If they do have to come in, call them ahead of time and screen for symptoms. Provide education and instruction about wearing a mask, respiratory etiquette, and hand hygiene. And it is equally important to help patients to develop a strategy for what they will do if they become ill. Help them to know when they should call the clinic and when they should seek medical treatment by going to a hospital. Personal, excuse me, personal protective equipment, or PPE, is used to mitigate the risk of exposure to potentially infectious material in healthcare. It is important to understand when and how to use PPE, and also to understand the limitations of the equipment. PPE is an important tool to protect healthcare workers, but it must be used correctly. PPE should be donned in a clean space and in such a way so as to reduce the chance of exposure of your skin or clothing to infectious material. When donning PPE, it is good practice to ask a colleague to either watch you don or to check your PPE before room entry to help identify any potential areas of skin or clothing exposure. Some areas that we commonly find exposed are the wrists, or the nose if the face mask slips down, slips below the nose and is only covering the mouth. When removing PPE, be careful not to inadvertently contaminate your skin or your clothing. The front of the face mask, face shield, and goggles, and the front of the gown 
are particularly contaminated and must be very carefully removed. Perform hand hygiene anytime these surfaces are touched and after PPE is removed. The risk of acquiring COVID-19 when correctly wearing PPE <clears throat> is low. As mentioned earlier, COVID-19 is generally spread by droplets expelled by coughing or sneezing. Fecal or direct contact contamination may also occur. Dialysis staff should employ standard contact and droplet precautions, including respiratory protection, eye protection with a face shield or goggles, and isolation gown and gloves. The highest risk of exposure to healthcare workers in these situations is during doffing, especially face masks. Many providers will inadvertently touch the front of their mask and then touch another part of themselves or their clothing, such as um, their face or their um, sleeve, um, without cleaning their hands first. During the Ebola crisis, there was only one nurse in the United States who, who acquired the infection from a patient, and it is believed that it was during self-contamination from the doffing process. We do know from this current coronavirus outbreak that this virus can live on surfaces for many hours or even days. We believe that contaminated surfaces play a role in the transmission of this virus, and that is why it is so crucial to perform hand hygiene anytime you touch the mask, even if it's in the middle of the doffing process, to avoid contamination of, the, of yourself or of the environment. If you do touch something contaminated, it's okay to disinfect your gloves before um, continuing the doffing process. Of course, one of the most important steps in preventing the spread of any infection is hand hygiene. Healthcare workers should perform hand hygiene before and after all patient contact, after contact with potentially infectious material, and before putting on and after removing PPE, including gloves. Hand hygiene after removing PPE is particularly important to remove any pathogens that might have been transferred to bare hands during the removal process. Preferentially, healthcare workers should perform hand hygiene using alcohol-based hand rub with at least a 60 to 90% alcohol content, or by washing hands with soap and water if they're vis visibly soiled. Face masks, also known as surgical masks or procedure masks in healthcare, are used to protect the mucous membranes of your nose, mouth, and respiratory tract from the organisms present in large droplets that are typically expelled when a patient coughs, sneezes, or talks. Respirators, or N95 masks, are used to protect the mucous membranes as well from organisms present in large and also very small airborne particles that are typically expelled during an aerosol generating procedure such as intubation or open suction. Initially, the CDC advised the use of N95 fitted masks as standard procedure in caring for patients with dangerous pathogens such as tuberculosis, but also it was initially recommended for COVID-19 as well. However, in the current environment of pandemic viral infection, standard surgical face masks are an acceptable alternative to N95 masks if they're not available. These respirators should be prioritized for procedures that are likely to generate airborne particles such as, as I mentioned, um, suctioning or um, intubation, if, especially if you're at the bedside of somebody who's critically ill or if you're going to be spending a large amount of time in a patient's room. Eye protection, such as goggles or face shields, should be used by all personnel when caring for patients with COVID-19 to avoid droplet spread via the eyes. Reusable shields and goggles can be cleaned and disinfected according to the manufacturer's reprocessing instruction, and they can be saved for later use. Remember that a cough or a sneeze can happen at any time, so you want to wear eye protection every time you're within six feet of the patient. And remember that personal glasses are not PPE. They do not protect the side of your eyes, and um, contact lenses in particular might even increase the risk of transmission just because you have to touch your eye to put them in. So um, neither of those are, are considered eye protection. Isolation gowns. These protect your skin and clothing from contamination, and they should be worn over the laboratory coat, scrub suit, 
um, street clothes, whatever it is that you'd normally wear to take care of a dialysis patient. If they're in short supply, they can be prioritized for um, procedures that are most likely to generate some kind of contamination, such as um, initiating or terminating dialysis or manipulating the needles. Um, assisting patients to and from the dialysis station, or cleaning and disinfecting the dialysis station. These gowns help protect your clothing, and they are contaminated, so they should be removed after caring for the COVID-19 patient and before moving on to the next patient. They cannot be worn from patient to patient. And of course, gloves. These help protect the skin on your hands and wrist from contamination. You want to put on clean gloves anytime you're going to be doing a clean procedure or touching a patient or touching a patient's environment. And then you want to change gloves and perform hand hygiene anytime they become contaminated during patient care. You also want to remove these before leaving the patient care environment, and they are not um, to be worn from patient to patient. So altogether, this is what PPE should look like on a healthcare worker preparing to care for a patient with COVID-19. Of course, the PPE used in your facility may vary. For instance, you may use goggles instead of a face shield, but consider how the PPE covers the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the front of the face, and the clothing down to the knees, the hands, and the wrists. The first example shows a healthcare worker wearing an N95 mask for respiratory protection. But as you can see on the, on the right, an acceptable alternative, as noted here, is a face mask with eye protection as well. As part of a initial and annual competency, staff should receive training on how to pr properly don and doff PPE, and also how to properly disinfect or dispose of PPE. I have the steps listed here, which I've taken directly from the CDC website, and they have some very nice posters that you can print out and you can um, display on your unit. Remember that PPE must be donned correctly before entering the patient care area or room and to ask your colleagues to check over your PPE to identify any exposed areas before entering the patient care space. PPE must be worn correctly and also for the duration of work in the potentially contaminated area, which includes the patient room or within six feet of the patient. Do not adjust PPE while performing patient care to avoid accidentally contaminating your clothes or your face. We find that the highest risk of exposure for a caregiver comes during the removing of the PPE, especially face masks. PPE should be removed carefully and slowly in a deliberate sequence, which prevents self-contamination. Here is listed the step-by-step -step process. And again, there are posters on the CDC website which may be printed and displayed on the unit. An important note is that the gowns and gloves should be removed before exiting the patient care space, and the eye and respiratory protection should be removed and discarded after leaving the patient care space, because those are the routes that are most vulnerable. There is also a great video on how to don and doff PPE. It's short. It's on the CDC website, and I've put the link to that video on the upper right of this slide. Because PPE likely will need to be deployed for many weeks or months in this current pandemic, care must be taken to establish policies that will not exhaust available supplies of these precious resources. The CDC has three different levels of PPE resources. We have the conventional, contingency, and crisis, and these are um, consider these are are um, based on how much how many shortages there are for PPE. Right now, most facilities are operating on either a contingency or a crisis basis because we do have shortages of N95 masks, surgical masks, and even isolation gowns in a lot of areas. Many facilities in conjunction with external partners, um, health departments and um, others, should work together to create strategies to extend the availability of PPE supplies to ensure that they're available, especially for high-risk situations, such as um, the critically ill um, bedside one-to-one -one care. Some facilities may employ extended use, and this means that the healthcare worker only removes the gown and the gloves and performs hand hygiene between patients while continuing to wear the same face mask and eye protection from patient to patient. 
Healthcare workers must take care not to touch their face mask or eye protection, and if they do, to perform hand hygiene. Remove it when soiled and when leaving the unit. Another strategy might be reuse. In times of severe shortage, it may become necessary to reuse face masks, respirators, and eye protection. Ensure that these items are stored in a breathable container, such as a plastic bag or hung to dry after disinfection. Items are considered contaminated even after disinfection and they must be handled as such with gloves and hand hygiene. So for environmental disinfection, we talked a lot about how contact is a possible route of transmission for this organism, but we do know that this it's kind of a wimpy virus and routine disinfection practices are sufficient at killing this, this virus. Um, so this includes um, how you would normally clean a dialysis chair, dialysis machine, any of the surfaces that are um, coming in contact with the patient, like the stethoscope or the blood pressure cuff. These can all be cleaned in the usual routine manner. But um, care should be taken to carefully wipe all surfaces, including all parts of the dialysis chair, after opening their arms and allowing them to air dry. And of course, you want to wait till the patient actually leaves the station. Although no change in these recommended procedures is needed, disinfection personnel should still wear the same PPE as the caregivers who took care of the infected patient. So if you have a separate environmental services person who does your cleaning, they should wear the same PPE that you would wear to take care of that patient. So the gown, the face mask, the um, eye protection. Uh, another benefit of cohorting patients infected with COVID-19 at the end of the day is that it allows for terminal cleaning to take place rather than having the pressure of um, shift turnover. Um, and don't forget to disinfect other high-touch surfaces in the rest of the dialysis unit, such as the scale or the waiting room, doorknobs, um, nurses' stations. Any surface or supply within six feet of a COVID patient should be disinfected or discarded. Disposable equipment should be used as much as possible and that all disposable equipment brought to the dialysis station should be discarded um, per usual. If it's not possible, then dedicated medical equipment should be used when cared, caring for patients with known or suspected COVID. If that's not possible, then all non-dedicated, non-disposable medical equipment should be cleaned and disinfected prior to exiting the patient room or the patient care area. Um, if you are wondering if your disinfectant is effective, then there is a list on the EPA website called List N, and this will this lists all of the products that have that are effective against this organism. But you want to make sure that it has a claim against both emerging viral pathogens and bloodborne pathogens because of um, the risks, other risks in di the dialysis units such as hepatitis. Um, any management of laundry, food service, medical waste, this is all done in the routine manner. So you'd wear, you'd wear gloves and you dispose of them in the uh, usual routine way. Um, so finally, I um, wanted to ask if your facility is ready to take care of one or more COVID-19 patient for up to several weeks per patient, depending on how long they're sick. This checklist was recently released by the CDC, and I encourage every facility to use this to identify their readiness. It is about five pages long, and it will give you some ideas of where to focus your readiness activities. Um, in closing, this is a time of unprecedented response to a pandemic that we have never seen before in our lifetimes. This undoubtedly creates anxiety and uncertainty in most of us. The closing of businesses and schools and entertainment facilities is a powerful tool in social distancing that is so crucial to preventing transmission of this disease. As healthcare facilities, we must remain open to perform those crucial life-saving functions that so many people rely on. The best thing that we can do to keep ourselves, our patients, and our families safe is to maintain a high level of vigilance, social distance, wear the recommended PPE, and keep your hands clean. If symptoms develop, it is important to self-quarantine, do not report to work, and keep your hands and surfaces clean and disinfected in your home. 
And um, thank you, everybody. And now I am uh, open to taking questions, if anybody has any. Okay. Um, so I see there's a question that says, um, how do dialysis nurses protect ourselves in the acute setting? Do we stay outside the patient's room to monitor? And that's um, the answer to that is yes. That is a strategy that is offered by the CDC as a way to help reduce the exposure time. However, it may not be appropriate in all clinical scenarios. There might be patients who have to have one-to-one -one bedside nursing. So if you are able to monitor the patient from outside the room, either through a window or a door or a camera, then it's advisable to do so. Um, another question is about face shields with foam at the forehead being acceptable in the dialysis clinic. Um, I am not aware of that being unacceptable for use in dialysis. I can see where there's some concern that foam might um, soak might hold on to uh, protect potentially infectious material. But if it does come in contact with that and become soaked in any way, then you would just dispose of it and, and um, get a new one. Um, let's see, should COVID positive patients also wear N95 masks? And the answer to that is no. The N95 mask is only of benefit to the wearer. So if a patient puts on an N95 mask, that is not going to make it them any less able to generate droplets that they will expel. Um, and the major reason for that is because it's not fit tested. The N95 has to be fit tested to the wearer's face in order to, to provide that seal. And so um, we don't fit test our patients, and it's not appropriate to put an N95 on a patient. A face mask or a cloth mask will work better. Um, let's see. Is it safe to reuse PPE such as disposable gowns if there is a shortage? It would be difficult to, dis to doff disposable gowns safely by pulling it over your head. Right, so it is safe to reuse some PPE if there's a shortage, but disposable gowns are not one of them. Um, it's safe to reuse, m m to reuse PPE that can be disinfected or that doesn't come in contact with the patient. So for instance, you might reuse a mask, but um, the mask does not come in contact with the patient. You might reuse a face shield or goggles because those can be disinfected, but a disposable gown cannot be disinfected. So you, it's not safe to wear that from patient to patient and definitely never gloves. Um, so somebody is asking about quarantine. Um, let's see, it says, hi, we are aware of the 14 day quarantine treatment time in a known COVID center, but what is the criteria to return to their home center if not retested? So the CDC criteria right now is that they have seven days from the time that they were first diagnosed, there has to be at least seven days, and then they have to have three days where they have where their symptoms are improved, or improving or improved, and fever-free without the use of a fever-reducing medication. Um, that's going to vary from facility to facility, so I would encourage you to have a policy that a written policy so that you can um, it'll be easier to follow and, and there's a standardized way. Um, <clears throat> somebody says, you mentioned that your nurse cares for three patients at a time. Are these patients at a separate room? Or are they all in the same space? So there's a couple, di the way we do it here is the patients are in separate rooms, but the nurse is in a very close vicinity and can see all three of them um, pretty much at the same time through their glass doors. Um, but patients can also be dialyzed in the same room together as long as you can provide six feet of space and they're all confirmed COVID patients. I wouldn't put COVID confirmed and COVID suspected patients in the same isolation room, but you can put um, confirmed in the same room together, as long as you can maintain adequate space between them. Somebody says, is PAPR superior to use versus N95? And the answer to that is yes. Um, the guidelines call for N95 or higher respirator. So an N95 will filter 95% of particles, and a PAPR is considered higher respiratory protection than an N95. 
so um, many facilities don't have access to PAPRs, but a lot of, of healthcare workers, especially those that have um, beards or other kind of facial um, piercings, might not be able to wear an N95 mask. So a PAPR is uh, an acceptable alternative for N95 masks in those situations. Um, let's see. Um, are there requirements for reporting exposures to other patients after a patient in their unit is deemed positive? This is going to vary from state to state. I would contact your health department if you have questions about this because your state may have a requirement and it may not. In our facility, initially, we were informing patients when there were exposures, but now because it's so en endemic in our area, um, we pretty much consider all people exposed, so we do not make individual um, notifications anymore. Um, somebody asked if two to three patients in acute care watch through a window if it's safe. Again, this is going to depend on the clinical picture of each of those patients. Um, the, the ones that I'm referring to are patients admitted to a regular medical unit. These would not be ICU patients. These would be um, just maintenance dialysis on routine patients admitted with a pneumonia. Um, let's see, important to teach and observe proper glove removal besides the gown. Has this been monitored with IC audits? That's a great question. Um, it is really important to, to uh, monitor, audit, all doffing. Um, if you're not familiar with the tools available on the Making Dialysis Safe for Patients Coalition website, they have some audit tools that include the donning and doffing of PPE, and that's one of those, um, that's one of those areas that, that you can audit. Let's see, somebody asked about shoe covers and head covers. So we have a lot of staff that wear both of those. I think it provides a level of um, uh, a feeling of protection or it eases some anxiety, but there is zero evidence that those are effective at preventing transmission of this virus. Um, just yesterday, IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, just released some infection control guidelines about COVID-19. And they did not address head coverings, but they did address shoe covers. And they had done a literature search, and they came to the same conclusion, that there is zero evidence that those are effective. But if it makes your staff feel better and, uh, you know, it's something that you have easy access to, um, then go ahead and provide it. Um, okay, I work at the Access Center, and we have all PPE plus shoe covers and surgical caps. Do these extra materials add precautions or no difference? So as I just mentioned, shoe covers and the surgical caps don't provide an extra level of protection, except maybe psychological safety. Um, and one other thing that I wanted to mention is that when you add more PPE on or you use it in a way that it's not intended to be used, you actually can increase the risk of contamination. Because if somebody is taking um, off, for instance, their hair covering, and their hands are dirty, and then they touch their hair, and their hair touches their face and gets in their eye. I mean, you can just see how that could spread, potentially spread infection that way. It's better to have their hair tied back and not to add anything else to the PPE. How do you avoid contamination from masks when they are reused multiple times? The surfaces are contaminated, but it is virtually impossible not to handle them between uses. That's a great question, and you're absolutely right. Um, the CDC website has the donning and doffing checklist that I mentioned earlier, and there are some techniques on there about how to safely remove the masks. You want to touch the straps, don't want to touch the front. If you do touch the front, then you want to disinfect your hands um, using the alcohol-based hand rub or gloves and hang them to dry. But you're right, they are contaminated if you're going to be reusing them. So just keep that in mind when you put them back on, that um, if you do happen to touch the front, to, that you have to disinfect your hands. Um, so somebody says, how do you best preserve a gown or a mask for reuse if you have a limited supply? Um, I would not reuse a gown for a COVID-19 patient. If, um, if you don't have enough gowns, then you want to prioritize them for those situations where you're going to be coming in closer contact with the patient, so initiation or discontinuation or helping them um, to or from the station, um, but do not wear them from patient to patient. Uh, let's see. We still use paper forms. What strategies are recommended to pre 
protect the papers from contamination? That's a great question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the virus can live for a full day on paper. So um, uh, it's, it's going to depend on the, the way the unit is set up, but any way that you can to not take those papers back to the nurse's station. If you have a computer that's like in a quote unquote dirty area that you can disinfect, I would recommend that. Um, but you don't want to take those papers back to the nurse's station because you're going to be contaminating that, those surfaces. Um, when you provide acute dialysis at the bedside in critical care, how is the machine decontaminated at the bedside or in the dialysis unit, which is our practice? I would disinfect it prior to leaving the room. And then if your practice is to disinfect it again on the unit, then um, you want to do it again there as well. But you definitely want to disinfect it before you take it out of the room because it's going to be contaminated. And so as you walk through the hallway or anybody else who touches it is going to risk contaminating them themselves. Um, somebody asked about the best way to disinfect a, re a reused N95. This is a really hot topic right now. Um, so there are a couple of different ways that people the, the FDA actually did have um, did release some emergency use, auth use authorizations for a few different ways to disinfect N95s. One is through vaporized hydrogen peroxide, and the other is through um, ultraviolet radiation. Their protocols vary, and um, here we are just starting to disinfect our N95s for reuse using hydrogen peroxide. Um, but the protocols, there's not a standard protocol. It's, um, it's something that's new and emerging. I, there's no other way to disinfect it besides those two. You definitely do not want to use um, like a disinfectant that you would use on another surface. So you don't use bleach, don't use Lysol, don't spray it with anything. Um, what is the recommended terminal cleaning process in the outpatient dialysis clinic? The terminal cleaning process would be exactly the same as you normally do terminal cleaning now. So you'll want to clean all the surfaces in the exact same way that you do now. Just make sure that the disinfectant that you use is on that EPA um, list of disinfectants that are effective against this virus. Um, if dialysis is performed at the bedside, do you decontaminate the machine at the bedside? Oh, I think we already covered that one. Um, so the procedure for de decontamination or disinfectant is exactly the same as you do now, and you do want to disinfect it before you take it out of the room. Do we know the time frame that the virus dies naturally? Someone asked, oh, someone asked, okay. Uh, we do not. We know that it can live for about a day on um, some surfaces and several days on others. What we don't know is if that virus, we can recover it, but we don't know if it's able to still cause disease, but we assume that it does. So um, I guess the answer to that would be several days. If you have a PUI or a positive patient, does the machine need to be bleached in between machine use or is it appropriate to heat and then bleach weekly? It's appropriate to heat and bleach weekly in the same way that you do now. Um, Somebody asked about CRRT, if others have been doing that. I know here we've had um, a lot of patients that have ended up in our ICU that have needed CRRT. I think that um, just from some of the reports that I'm reading, um, acute kidney injuries are pretty common with these patients, and so we do end up with a lot of patients who need um, a, a acute dialysis. Um, <clears throat> somebody says, I always thought and was taught that using hand sanitizer on gloves was not best practice. Has this changed? Uh, you are absolutely right. It is not best practice to do that. However, if your gloves become contaminated during the doffing process only, then it is appropriate to decontaminate them just to prevent any further transmission of that virus. You definitely do not want to decontaminate your gloves during patient care. So that is not a strategy to use during patient care. But as you're doffing your PPE, um, it, is, it is appropriate to do that if they become contaminated. During Ebola, um, it, it was actually part of the routine of doffing, was every time you took a piece of PPE off, you would decontaminate your hands with alcohol hand rub. So in certain situations, it is appropriate, but not routinely. Um, so what is your take on how staff deal with COVID negative patients but have many clinical symptoms like coughing or fever? So this is a tricky one because 
um, you know, this is a new disease. The tests that we've developed are also um, new. They haven't been on the market long enough to even appropriately validate. We don't know what the um, exact sensitivity is. We, we, uh, we don't really know what the false negative rate is. So we have patients here that we might test. Um, oh, sorry, my computer shut down. Um, that we might test using two or three different um, two or three different times just to establish that yes or no they don't have it. We even had one patient that we had to test the antibodies on because the practitioners were convinced that they had it. Um, it, it I, th I would say that you would. If you suspect COVID, then you want to treat them like they have COVID. If their test is negative, then you would treat them like you would any other respiratory infection. So you'd still want to maintain six feet of distance between them and any other patients, offer them tissues, counsel them about hand hygiene, and still have them wear a mask just as a method of source control. Somebody says, would I use an N95 or PAPR only when the patient which I am dialyzing has an aerosolized procedure or for every COVID patient, talking about inpatients? So, Right now, the CDC recommends that you wear an N95 or higher respirator anytime you take care of a COVID patient. However, we also recommend or recognize that there is shortages in many places or some facilities might not have a program where they have N95 respirators available. So in those situations, a face mask is acceptable. Um, but if you're caring in acute care for a patient with COVID, then um, you should wear an N95 or a PAPR. How do we do social distancing in the in-center dialysis? Our patients sit closer than six feet. They do wear masks while in the center. So I am unclear about if that's while they're being dialyzed or if it's that's in the waiting room. Um, but one, what, one, I saw one waiting room here that turned every other chair backwards. And that kind of promoted that space so that people couldn't sit directly next to each other without flipping the whole chair around. But most people didn't do that. Um, if it's in center, then you definitely would want to get some kind of a barrier in between those patients, a, a ga um, uh, what's the word, curtain or something that's in between those patients just to create a barrier. Um, somebody's asking about widespread testing of healthcare workers. Hearing what is available now for testing is highly variable for accuracy. So that's true. Um, right now, I don't believe that there's any recommendation that healthcare workers just be routinely screened, but definitely if they have symptoms or um, some kind of exposure, then you'd want to consider screening um, your healthcare workers. Um, <clears throat> so somebody asks about safety concerns being raised with an acute care nurse remaining outside of a patient's room with limited visibility. Um, and the time it would take to redon PPE to address a dialysis machine alarm or an emergency, the use of nanny cams. So that is one strategy that was recommended by the CDC was that the uh, nurses, uh, I, I wouldn't say observe with limited visibility. You definitely would want to have full visibility, but you can use something like a nanny cam to keep closer eye on them. You could also um, sit outside the room and have be ready to go, have your, your isolation gown on so that the only thing you have to to dawn before you go in the room is your, your mask and your um, eye protection. Where do we obtain the outpatient dialysis facility assessment tool? That is available on the CDC website and on that slide I included the link directly to that tool. Um, should the cleaning personnel be fitted for an N95 or use a regular mask and PPE if the unit has a positive or suspected COVID-19 patient? So the cleaning personnel, if you have a respiratory program can be fitted for an N95, but if the only time they would ever need it would be to care for and uh, uh, take care of a dialysis station after a COVID patient, then a regular surgical face mask is an acceptable alternative. Um, let's see, do you have any further recommendations for long-term care or rehab patients coming to outpatient units other than universal screening we are currently performing prior to entering the facility? includes wearing a mask during treatment. No, that is um, that should be adequate. That should help you identify any anybody that you think might have COVID and also have that source control or help, help to reduce the amount of droplets that they're able to expel. What is the recommendation for CPR in clinic? That's a great question. I cannot comment on that. As far as I know, um, 
the CPR recommendation remains the same. You would still perform CPR, but um, um, be, intubation would be an aerosol generating procedure. So there, there's something to think about with that because you want to make sure anybody in the vicinity would have an N95 mask on. <clears throat> Um, is it okay to put the surgical mask outside the patient room, not in direct contact, but rooms are not in negative pressure? Um, I guess I don't understand that question. Is it okay to put surgical masks outside the patient room um, as PPE? Yes, that, that's fine. Um, did you mention we are to wear double gloves? It looked like single in the steps removal. Double gloves are a strategy that some people use. Um, there's, there's not data for or against it. That was also addressed in those recent um, IDSA guidelines that came out over the weekend. Um, again, showing there's not really a benefit. So you can if you want to, but you lose some dexterity when you do so. And it doesn't really provide a better barrier than one set of gloves. Somebody asks what a PAPR is. So a PAPR stands for a um, positive air purifying respirator. And so this is something, it's like a hood that you wear over your head. It covers your, your face um, down to your neck. And it's connected to a battery pack that provides fresh continuous air that's filtered. And it's a positive pressure. So the air goes into the hood and then out the side of the hood. And it protects your respiratory systems because nothing can get in um, in through the front of the hood, it can only get in through the um, filter pack. It's an alternative to N95 respirators. Um, let's see, so somebody asks about mitigating risks for patients on high flow O2 and nebulizers. High flow O2 is not considered um, an aerosol generating procedure, but BiPAP, CPAP, and nebulizers are. So if you are taking care of a patient who is getting any of those therapies, then you would need to wear an N95 mask without question anytime you're in the room. How to DOS PPE if there's no double door in the patient's room? Um, the, you would want to DOS your gloves, well, your gown and your gloves inside the patient room, but leave your respirator and your eye protection on until you exit the room. Um, are duckbill masks a good protective mask? We were fit tested for these. Uh, and absolutely, those are um, just a different, N95 just refers to how much filtering capability the mask has. There are many, many different models. The, there's the uh, 3M and Halyard and, and many different kinds and the duckbill is one of those. Um, is it okay to use surgical mask in a COVID unit but not direct contact? Uh, yes, that's, that's acceptable. Somebody asked about the preparedness checklist again, and that is on the CDC website. And I also put the direct link on that slide, which I believe you'll have access to the slides at the end of the presentation. Um, somebody says, if you have to stay in a room with positive patient for a prolonged time, would it be helpful to wear shoe covers and hair covers? Again, there's no data that indicates that that prevents transmission of infection but uh, we do realize that it provides some sense of psychological safety. So if you feel better, then absolutely. Um, I would caution you though that, um, that removing extra PPE can add to the risk of contamination. For instance, when you're taking off your hair cover, you might inadvertently contaminate your hair or the side of your face. Um, So how do you suggest the psychological challenge or burden that the pandemic is or may cause among our chronic care patients? Or is there any coping strategies that you can share? That's a great question. Um, definitely, I think mental health is something that, um, that, is, that is going to become increasingly important as this pandemic goes on and social isolation goes on for patients and for healthcare workers. I know that on the CDC website, they do have some patient education that's really helpful. I think at least opening up that conversation. Patients are scared and they don't have the same level of information that we do as healthcare workers and maybe they don't under, understand in the same way that we do. Um, and they see things on the news and they're scared. And so even if you don't have the answers, I think just having that conversation with them, acknowledging that and then providing them the education that we do have available um, can help to ease some of their worries. 
Um, is there a recommended disinfectant for cleaning the stations? And uh, the answer is no. There is a list that you can refer to on the EPA website, list N. That is all the available ones, but the, um, the bleach that is commonly used is effective. Um, so somebody asks about hand washing versus alcohol for hand hygiene. Can you provide a rationale? So um, alcohol-based hand rub is preferred for hand hygiene for most organisms, excluding C. diff. So that includes this organism. You should use an alcohol-based hand rub. And the reason why is because it's immediately effective and immediately kills the virus. Hand washing, on the other hand, is um, does not kill the virus, and it does not kill most organisms. The way that it works is through the friction and the water. It physically removes the, the organism from your hand. So that is only as effective as the person who is washing their hands um, is. If they can scrub in all the areas, do it for 20 seconds, get all the surfaces, and then rinse it effectively, then you can rinse the virus away. So that's why alcohol-based hand rub is the preferred method, because it actually works directly on the virus, directly on your hands. Um, if the patient is provided a mask, can the patient reuse the mask for the next treatment in an outpatient setting? And the answer is absolutely. Um, we actually do that in our outpatient dialysis clinic. We save the mask and we put it in a paper bag and um, every week they get a new one. But every time they come to the clinic, they, they reuse that same mask. Um, let's see. There are many variations of N95 masks, including 3M masks with a vent in place. Are they just as efficient as the green N95? Also, what if you can still smell through the mask? Are they okay? So the answer to that is yes. If they have the N95 rating on the front and it says NIOSH approved, then it will remove 95% of airborne particles of what you breathe. Um, if you can still smell through it, that um, yeah, that's not an indication that it's not working. Somebody asks about using an N95 for only 12 hours, and the CDC does not limit the length of time for an N95 um, use. That's not well studied. It's going to really depend on how you're using it. If it comes into contact with a lot of wet items, if, if, um, if the integrity is somehow in jeopardy, then it won't last 12 hours. But there's a lot of industries where, like construction or uh, manufacturing, where they wear those N95 respirators for an ent entire 12-hour shift without any problems. So it can be worn for, for 12 hours. Um, somebody asked if it's possible to disinfect a standard face mask with elastic over ears for reuse. And the answer is yes. The contaminated portion is the front, the plastic that's directly in front of the patient. So that's the portion that um, needs to be disinfected. The elastic that's over the ears also needs to be disinfected, but um, there's no risk of transmission with that once it's disinfected. Okay, somebody wants to know about what study we can read that proves that disinfection of N95 masks is effective. And unfortunately, we do not have that data. This is a brand new strategy to a brand new problem that we never really had before. We have always had adequate supplies of PPE, um, but we haven't had a pandemic like this, um, you know, in 100 years. So um, this is a new strategy. So the what we do know is that the companies, the um, UV and the hydrogen peroxide companies, have done some small studies in in their in their laboratory settings and also in a few universities, and they've been able to provide enough data to the FDA to show that it's probably effective, and um, they don't recover any uh, viruses off of those. Um, disinfected surfaces, and so they were, able to re, re, uh, they were able to get emergency use author, authorization, or EUA, from the FDA to reprocess N95 masks, but we're not going to find um, studies, definitely not like an RCT or anything. Oh, um, I heard a noise. Am I supposed to stop now? I'm sorry. No, we're going to go for another five. Okay. Um, is it necessary to clean floors also? Um, Yes, as part of your terminal cleaning, you should definitely clean the floors too. Um, if a patient presents with a fever, shouldn't blood cultures be drawn to determine if it's a BSI and not COVID? So a fever is one of those non-specific findings. There can be a million things that can cause a fever, and, including COVID and a BSI, and both of those can occur in the same patient at the same time. 
So if you do have a patient who presents with a fever, um, you definitely want to look at what their other symptoms are. If they don't have any respiratory symptoms, it's, it, you know, maybe it's not COVID. If they had an exposure, uh, maybe it's COVID. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't also have a bloodstream infection. So, um, you know, you want to look at all of your clinical signs before you make that decision. Um, do you need to wait two hours prior to disinfecting the outpatient dialysis station to allow aerosols and droplets to settle on surfaces? And the answer to that is no. If they happen to be in an airborne isolation room under negative pressure undergoing aerosol generating procedures, there is a time for that before you disinfect. But in a regular dialysis unit, uh, no, you don't have to wait any particular amount of time before you disinfect because most of what they're expelling are those large droplets that fall to the floor um, within a few seconds. They're not um, producing aerosols. Um, somebody says, talks about UV light to disinfect or to decontaminate. So I don't know if that's for surfaces or for um, PPE, but um, I'll address both. For surfaces, UV is a very effective adjunct therapy to cleaning and disinfection. So you can't do it in place of it, but definitely if you add it to a cleaning and a disinfection program, um, it can add some additional um, disinfection above and beyond your normal practices. And um, the same is true for PPE. Um, it's, it's an adjunctive strategy when your PPE supplies are running low to disinfect with uh, UV or hydrogen peroxide, as the case may be. Um, let's see. Somebody is asking about... Prior to cannulating a graft or fistula, we clean our gloves or fingertip chlorhexidine sponge used previously on the patient's fistula area. One nurse would use sanitizer gel on her gloves. Is this a problem? Um, let's see. I, I guess I can't really comment on that. Um, you know, sanitizer is not really intended to be used as a skin antiseptic on gloves. Um, I, I guess I can't comment on that. I'm sorry. Um, somebody is asking about COVID patients being clotters using heparin is advisable. So this um, flushing normal stanley would make us go into the patient's room often. So that's a clinical decision. Um, I can't advise on that. It's funny that you mentioned the clotting, though, because this is something that's emerging now is that um, – we think that a lot of patients with COVID actually end up with a problem with clotting. So more to come, I'm sure, on that. But that's um, something that you'll have to talk to their nephrologist about. Um, we have a makeshift dialysis room to dialyze two COVID patients at the same time by one nurse. Room is not negative pressure. This is our hospital acute. Exposure-wise, we are in the room for continuous 10 to 12 hours. Is it safe for the nurse? Yes, it is safe for the nurse, provided that you wear the appropriate PPE. So if you're going to be... The, the room doesn't have to be negative pressure unless you're going to be doing aerosol generating procedures, which it doesn't sound like you will be. Those include um, like intubation or BiPAP. Um, so, yes, it's safe to be in that room for 10 to 12 hours, but you want to wear an N95 mask or a PAPR instead of a face mask. Um, if you have been monitoring from outside the room and have to don and go in the room, would you recommend to remain in the room? Um, that depends on, on what's going on. If you just have to go in to, you know, bring them some tissues or cover them up or something, then no, you don't have to stay in. But if you're going in and out continuously, then yes, it's better to stay in because uh, you want to minimize the number of possible contaminations through doffing your PPE. All right, somebody and says... One more question. Okay, I just wanted to make a comment. Somebody says about the CPR question to please refer to new AHA, BLS, ACLS recommendations from 4-9-2020. These are important changes. So thank you for that. Um, I'm not aware of those changes. So yes, if everybody can refer to those to get those CPR questions answered. And they, they are on the uh, AHA website, just so you know. So this is Sally Russell again, and I want to thank all of you for being with us. And I certainly, from the bottom of my heart, thank Dr. Milson for, for sharing this wonderful information. I learned so much this evening, um, some of it I never thought I would need to know, but I do. 
Um, so with that, um, if we could, we'd be giving you a great round of applause. So know that you're getting it virtually somehow, some way. So thank you for that. Um, as you do, as, as we close down, you will be getting um, information on, on and we'll send you back to the ANNA library where you will fill out the evaluation form um, and then you can download your CE certificate. But please do tell us what you thought of this, the webinar um, on that evaluation. You know, are there other topics that, that are needed? Uh, be sure to visit ANNA's website at annanurse.org. Um, just so that you can see, we do have, have other COVID resources that are free for people to use. So we would love to have you be able to utilize that. If you have any additional questions or comments, please contact the ANNA National Office. Thank you for joining us today. Have a pleasant evening. Um, and, and thank you all for being with us. And again, Tara, thank you so much for being so willing to share your expertise. Oh, thank you, Sally. It was my pleasure. Okay. Good night, everyone.